Okay. So today we uh, we're going to talk about um, Eilenberg McLean spaces, so like configuration space models for them, and also simplicial models for them, which turn out to be the same thing. And you know we'll review um, simplicial sets and simplicial spaces. Um, yeah. Okay, so the, the goal for the next few lectures, which probably we'll get to this week, is to show that um, the, uh, the homotopy groups of maps from a space into um, three abelian group on a cube rel its boundary are just the uh, shifted cohomology groups of the space. So uh, in the words of, you know, in the language from the first lecture, it's the statement that maps into this um, three abelian group are um, space level homology. And so today we're gonna to be mostly focusing on um, sort of the, this space right here that I've highlighted, you know, three abelian group on a interval or on a cube rel its boundary. Uh, we'll talk about its properties. Its properties are it's an island burn McLean space and we'll talk about uh, them more more generally, uh, and try to get uh, everyone on the, the same page. So for some people, this might be a reasonable amount of review. Um, you know, other people, uh, it might be all new, so feel free to slow me down. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. So um, uh, last time we... Uh, I read you a slightly incorrect proof of um, the fact that if we have a, you know, a discrete abelian group and um, a sub, you know, y is a sub CW complex of x, then the um, homotopy groups, the free abelian group on x mod uh, mod the free abelian group on y is just the uh, relative homology with coefficients in a. So the proof. You know, the proof was we checked the Island Bergstein rod axioms, and the only thing that was, um, or the, you know, by far the hardest part was checking this long exact sequence of a pair. And, um, you know, that involved showing that the quotient map was a fibration or uh, something like that. Okay. And uh, so for a, for a topological monoid, or sorry, for a topological abelian group, we can just take this to be the definition. So if A has topology, we can define a homology with coefficients in A just to be the homotopy groups of A of X mod A of Y. And, um, you know, this is a reasonable definition. It turns out not to be that interesting because it turns out to, um, well, we'll see in one example that um, it doesn't give you, you know, in, well, in this example, it won't give you anything new and then I'll, uh, Say you know in words that this is actually fairly general. And, uh, okay, so any guesses, maybe initially not from Manuel or Zach, what the homology of a space with coefficients in the circle are? You know, we're here we're viewing this circle with its topology. You know, or what, what do you think, like, um, okay, any, Zach, do you have a guess? Um, like, pi i minus one of x? Yeah, or H hi. It's, it's, it's shifted homology of x, not homotopy. I don't know if you misspoke, but yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's just going to be the homology of x. Uh, but shifted, and um, uh, so you know the reason why this definition isn't super important is for abelian groups. This ends up just being um, like ordinary homology or direct sums of ordinary homology uh, with the degrees shifted. But you know, let's see this this explicitly when uh, we're taking coefficients in S one. Okay, so, um, you know, the homology of X with coefficients in S1 
by definition, that's um, pi i of s1 of x. So it's pi i of configurations of points in x labeled in s1. Well, um, you know, s1 is, is homotopy equivalent to uh, the free abelian group on i mod the free abelian group on the boundary. You know, so how do you see that? Well, um, you know, why do these two spaces have the same homotopy group? First, how do we see that? And then how do you build a map? Any? How would you compute the homotopy groups of the right-hand side? So like what what does this theorem say um when x is the interval and y is the boundary of the interval So um, so I guess the, the theorem says that, you know, so here we're plugging in A is S1, X is the interval, and Y is the uh, boundary of the interval. So it says that's just the um, homology with coefficients in A. So here we're applying it. So A is Z. So it's the homology of the interval rel the boundary of the interval. So what is, uh, like as abelian groups, what's the homology? of the interval rel boundary of the interval. Oops. Yeah, so the side is, uh, you know, it's your star. Well, it's the homology of S1, right? Yeah, it's, this, it's the reduced homology of S1. Mm -hmm. So this is... Uh, R S1, so that's... Z. So it's Z for the H1 and 0 for the, anything above that, right? Yeah, and 0 and degree 0. Yeah. Because it's reduced. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the... Uh, that's the same thing as like the homotopy groups. Uh, I should use a better tool for. Okay. Um, yeah, so the homotopy groups, it, you know, it's just Z in degree zero, or sorry, zero in degree uh, zero, Z in degree one, then zero everywhere else. So, and then that's the same as the homotopy groups of S1 because we um, we talked about how the homotopy groups of a space and its universal cover agree and the universal cover of S1 is, or sorry, the higher homotopy groups of S1 are zero because the homotopy groups of, the higher homotopy groups of a space and its universal cover agree, and the universal cover of S1 is contractible. So the higher homotopy groups of S1 are zero. And then, um, you know, pi one of S one is Z, and S one is connected, so pi zero is the the trivial group. So these two spaces have the same homotopy groups. How do you get a map? How do we build a map from S one into here? So you know, two spaces are are um, re spaces with reasonable topology or homotopy equivalent. If there's a map that induces an isomorphism of homotopy groups, uh, you know, what's a natural map from S1 into free abelian group on I rel the boundary? You know, or what's you know, what what what's what's a non-constant map?
you know, so we should view we should view S1 as the interval of the boundary. Uh, now, any takers on what a natural map from the interval mod the boundary to the free abelian group on the interval mod the free abelian group on the boundary is? Um, maybe choose a point from S1 that's going to be mapped to the boundary. So that's going to be mapped to zero. And then you can identify the rest of S1 with, with the interval, right? And then you yeah. just map it to where it should map. Yeah. So yeah, I guess what you're, you're, you're sort of ignoring this hint, but you gave the right map. So get rid of the, uh, ignore the hint. You're just saying, okay, I'm going to view this as like, we got one point here and then the rest of S1, I'm going to send like this, this point here to, well, I don't know, that's like 30% of the way up. So we'll send it to 30% of the way in the interval and we'll label it by the number one. That's what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Yep, that's what I meant. So that gives a map and then maybe it's not obvious that it induces an ISO on homotopy groups, but it does. Um, so, you know, these two spaces are homotopy equivalent, not just they have the same homotopy groups. I think next class will rigorously Prove this if you don't believe the map induces an ISO. Probably one can um, check that. Okay. Any questions before I delete all of the scribbles? Okay. So um, S1 is just configurations of points in the interval, mod its boundary. And then the next claim is that, so, you know, so instead, so we can just replace S1 with Rebuilding group on interval mod its boundary. Claim is this line. This line is kind of long. Let me just... uh, I think someone is not on mute. Um, okay. The uh, free. Okay, so the free abelian group uh, on I mod the boundary uh, of X is, you know, sort of configurations of points in the interval, rel boundary, uh, configurations of points in X, labeled by configurations of points in I mod boundary, is homeomorphic to configurations of points in X cross I mod I cross boundary. I don't know if I said this equality correctly, but written down. So what's the math? So something on this side is, well, here I'm picturing X as the circle. So I'm saying we have, uh, we have points in the circle, and each point in the circle is labeled by a configuration of the interval rel boundary. So this is a picture of an element over here, and the map sending it over here is, I don't know, is the map I depicted. So this is its image on the right um, in this space. Any questions about this step. I'm claiming there's a homeomorphism and I've drawn a picture of the homeomorphism. Okay. And then we just use, uh, I guess this theorem, uh, again, to say, okay, so now we're interested in the homotopy groups of this space. Well, that's just the relative homology. Uh, yeah, so we've computed that H1 of X with coefficients in S1 is H1 of the interval cross X rel um, boundary of the interval cross X. And I'm not, not quite smart. I tried to say something about suspensions and I got confused because I always get confused about suspensions. But let's just compute the, what these groups are using the long exact sequence. So the summary is the last page showed that the hum, um, Homology of X with coefficients in S1 is just the homology of X cross I rel um, X cross boundary of I. So we can just look at the long exact sequence of the pair. And um, 
Yeah, so homology of x cross boundary of i, this is boundary of i is just two points. So this is just homology of x plus homology of x. Homol you know, interval is contractible, so this is homology of x. Uh, this is the group we're interested in. And then, you know, same down here. So, um, you know, inclusion of the interval into, or the boundary of interval into an interval is just um, the identity map on each factor. So this map is the identity map on each factor. So this is surjective. Um, this is surjective. So that means this is surjective. Uh, so that means this map is zero. Is that how things work? Uh, you know, this map is surjective. So that means this this group is isomorphic to the kernel. Um, so I guess that says that H1 or HI of X with coefficients in S1 is the, the kernel. Of uh, squared I guess it's written down here. I was going to ask, what is this kernel? Um, you know, the kernel of a map from, like, if you have a group A, the kernel of A directs some A mapping to A is just, is isomorphic to A. Um, so that gives us this, um, this isomorphism. Yeah. So the homology of X with coefficients in S1 is just the homology of X shifted uh, degrees. So, you know, um, not, doesn't provide you a uh, silly question, but would you mind explaining the um, uh, ISO on the left, the vertical one? That this one? This one? Yep. Yeah, so, well, I mean, I, I'm just saying X cross boundary of I is homeomorphic to X disjoint union X. Yeah, I see. And it was a it was a silly question. It's just oh, too yeah, no, it's better to um better to you know, occasionally there'll be a fact, so it's good to mm -hmm. um yeah. I, I feel like I'm going way too fast in general, so it's like slowing me down is always good. Um. Okay. Any any other any questions about any step in this um. This proof. Okay. Um, oh yeah. So the you know, main definition today is a island bourbon clean spaces. Uh, I guess we're primarily interested in the case that. Uh, G is abelian, but we might as well talk a little bit about it in the case that it's not necessarily abelian. So um, the theorem is that uh, for all uh, n uh, greater than zero in groups G, um, where G is required to be abelian if n is bigger than or equal to two, then there's a unique uh, unique up to homotopy space called uh, KGN, whose homotopy groups are G in degree n and zero in all other degrees. Uh, I guess you can, you know, if you want, you can have a theorem for n equals zero and a set, um, but that's kind of a boring theorem. So, um, you know. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So let's uh, talk about some examples. Uh, you know, so the this generalizes uh, free, you know, so the, like the the free abelian. I should probably should have started with this, but the the free abelian group on um, the interval mod free abelian group on the boundary is a uh, you know or is an island bergman McLean space. Um, yeah. Okay. So I probably should have started with that to connect it back to what we're talking with, but uh, so 
here's some example that's kind of different from the examples we've been talking about before. The theorem is that a um, a wedge of um, a wedge of circles is an eilenberg maclean space for the free group. So a wedge of n copies of the circle is an eilenberg maclean space for um, the nth free group. Okay. So, uh, you know, first thing is, you know, like Van Kampen tells you that the fundamental group of this space is the free group. So now we just need to check that all the higher homotopy group, groups vanish. Again, the, um, the homotopy groups of a, the higher homotopy groups of a space and its universal cover agree. So let's let E be the universal cover. Um, you know, the claim is that, uh, you know, first that E is a graph because, uh, you know, a wedge of circles A wedge of circles is a graph, and you know any cover yeah okay, so this is maybe this is the picture for when n is two, and then any cover uh this is a picture of a cover. this is not the universal cover, but this is some other cover um. Any cover of a graph is a graph because locally, um, locally the a cover looks like the um, the base space, and being a graph is a local property. So you know what do we know about the universal cover? It's a graph, and it's simply connected. While which graphs are simply connected? Only trees, and trees are contractible. So you know, tree means no loop. Um, yeah, so that um, tells us that um, you know the higher homotopy groups of the this wedge of circles are the same thing as the higher homotopy groups of the universal cover, which are trivial because E's a graph or E's a tree. Any questions? Like, I'm happy to say what a tree is, etc. Okay, yeah. So the, the the remark is that this proof strategy, you know, generalizes to say that any space is a um, eilenberg maclean space if the universal cover is contracted. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so the next example of an eilenberg maclean space for n equals one is the the uh, uh, the the um, configuration spaces of points in R infinity give you an eilenberg maclean space for the uh, uh, symmetric group SN. So recall, confen is the space of, um, you know, you could think of confen as the um, space of sets of size N in a space. So it's it's points. The points are unlabeled. You, you know they're indistinguishable from each other, and they're distinct. They're distinct but indistinguishable. And um, S n is the symmetric group. So by the mark from the last page, we just need to show that the fundamental group of this space is the symmetric group, and that its uh, universal cover is um, contractible. So. Uh, we're going to show that the ordered configuration space is the universal cover. So this is the configuration space of um, n ordered points. This is what the tilde means. Uh, this would be helpful if I wrote out the definition of these two spaces for anyone. Would uh, be helpful for me. Okay. Yeah. So let's. Um, this, this is text. Okay. Um, so the, the tilde on N X. Um, so this is, um, you know, it's the set of like X one dot 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 X N. 
such that you know xi is not equal to xj, or i not equal to j, and this is a subset of um, um, of x to the n. Um, yeah, so this is you know the the subset of x to the n of distinct points, and then conf n x is tilde conf n x mod symmetric group. Yeah, so um, you take the so you just mod out by the action of the symmetric group that permutes the order. So this is distinct ordered points in, in X, and this is um, distinct unordered points in X. Okay. So, yeah, does that, should I say anything else about the, the definitions? Oh, no, that's good. Uh, at least that's okay. clear. So Jeremy, so why is that tilde conf simply connected? Uh, oh, or well, I'm going to prove it's contractible. So in general, it's not always oh, okay. it's not always simply connected. Um, even if you know, even if X is simply connected, tilde conf doesn't need to be simply connected. Right, okay. But it's it's just because like R infinity is really big. Yeah. Um yeah, so uh like when and you know if you if you look at the ordered configurations in R2, the fundamental group is the pure braid group, which is definitely not uh, the trivial group. Okay, so we want to show that this space is contractible, so we'll show that it's it's homotopy groups are zero. Uh, so it's, uh, I guess we'll prove this by induction on n. So for n equals zero, uh, this space is just a point. So it's obvious that the, or it's clear that the homotopy groups are all zero. Um, so we'll prove it by induction. Um, so we can, uh, in the ordered configuration, in the ordered configuration space, you can forget the nth point. So here's the configuration space of endpoints. They all are ordered. This map forgets the nth point. Um, so that's, uh, you know, you can see that this map is a fiber bundle, and the fiber is going to be, um, you know, R infinity um, minus n minus one points. Yeah, because, so this map forgets the last point. And so, um, what's the fiber? Well, it's all the possible choices for where the nth point is. Uh, you know, the nth point is not where points one through n minus one are, uh, but otherwise there are no conditions. So it's just some point in R infinity minus n minus one. Um, so you you know, R two minus ten points is a wedge of, uh, is, you know, is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of uh, 10 copies of S1. R3 minus 10 points is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of uh, 10 copies of S2, et cetera. Uh, so R infinity minus N minus one points is a wedge of N minus one copies of S infinity. Um, yeah, is this any questions up to like um, you know, up to here? I'm happy to, you know, should I I'm happy to repeat what this map is or why the fibers are infinity minus n minus one points or anything? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so if we can show the idea is if we can show that the fiber is contractible, then by induction, 
the homotopy groups of this vanish, and the homotopy groups of the fiber will vanish, and then the long exact sequence of homotopy groups associated to the vibration will tell us that the homotopy groups of this vanish. Okay, so to show that this space is contractible, we just need to show that this space is contractible. And okay, it's a wedge of simply connected spaces, so Van Kampen tells us um, that it's simply connected, is you know, a wedge of simply connected spaces. You know, I mean, I'll be simply connected, um, and it is trivial homology. I guess it's trivial reduced homology uh, because you know um, s s infinity is just the colimit of s ends. So the colimit of the homology of spheres is uh, zero in positive degrees and z in degree zero. So just this trivial reduced homology. So um, the the Hravich theorem tells us that the homotopy groups of this vanish because the fundamental group vanishes and the homology vanishes. So this space is contractible. Um, so, you know, by induction, this space is contractible using the long exact sequence of homotopy groups. Any, anything I should repeat about why configurations and- Yeah, in, yeah I, I got lost just there. Um, why is it that you concluded that uh, everything was contractible? Okay, are you, so this, uh, okay, so the idea is we're, you know, we're proving it by induction. So by induction, we're assuming the n minus one thing is contractible. Yep. And then are you happy with the statement if we know the fiber is contractible, then the total space is contractible? Mm -hmm. is, is that this question or is the question why is the fiber contractible or both? Um... So, you know, so if you have, you know, Right. No, it was about the fiber. Like, why? Why was the the specific fiber contractible? Oh yeah. So um, that's um, here. Yeah. No, so but, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. So so the, there are two steps, and we're just going to show it as trivial homology, and we're going to show its trivial fundamental group. And the Hravich theorem will then say it is trivial homotopy groups, and then Whitehead will say it's contractible. And the idea is just, like, okay. For S infinity, it's clearly simply connected because you know the check something simply connected. You just check that the two skeleton is simply connected. The two skeleton is um, S two, so each S infinity is simply connected. Right. And then you know a wedge of simply connected spaces by Van Kampen is going to be simply connected. Mm -hmm. And then the homology. The reduced homology of a wedge is just the direct sum of the reduced homologies of each piece. So we just need to check that the reduced homology of S infinity is zero. And, um, you know, it's going to, it's, it's the co-limit of Sn, so the reduced homology will just be the co-limit of um, the homologies of the Sn's, you know, and the, so it will just be, it'll be like one degree you look at like HI, you know, I guess homology will com commute with co-limits in this situation. Um, you know, so like I, you, you, you keep pushing the copy of Z until it goes away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. That, uh, yeah. I mean, if you're looking like, you know, what's, what's the hom reduced homology of a sphere? Well, it's Z. Or what's yeah, at a degree n and then zero everywhere. Yeah, the reduced homology of a d sphere is z in degree d and zero everywhere else. Well, d is infinity, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. So there's yeah. no homology. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you could also just write down a cell structure on s infinity and just calculate the homology. Um, like you can. I mean, that would also work to show that it's homology is zero. So then once we know that the reduced homology is zero and the fundamental group is zero, we get that the homotopy groups are zero. Okay, so the, um, so, you know, the universal cover is contractible. So all we need, so this will be an islandberg McLean space for whatever the fundamental group is. And now, um, uh, we just need to compute the fundamental group. How do you compute the fundamental group? Well, you know, with covering spaces is a good way. So, um, 
um, you know, this space is simply connected and, you know, okay, yeah, so you can look at um, the map from ordered configurations to unordered configurations. That's a covering space. The fiber is SN. Uh, it's the universal cover because this is, you know, this is contractible, so it's in particular simply connected. So this is the, is the universal cover. The fiber is SN, so that tells us that um, I1 of configuration space is SN. Um, yeah, any, any questions? Things I can repeat? I have a question. Um, could you explain why, I mean, you're giving a name to Eilenberg McLean spaces, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, you're defining them to be spaces with certain homotopy groups. So can you explain yeah. to what extent they are unique? Oh yeah, okay. So the, the theorem, which we'll prove next time. And also, you know, if this is actually just like you telling me I should be teaching better, feel free to just say it directly <laughs> instead of- <laughs> I, I, no, I, I just want to make it more complete, right? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, but like if you, you know, I'm just saying like if you'd rather say like this statement is slightly misleading and then tell a story, like feel free to do that instead of asking. Okay, okay. But like I can tell it also. And like I agree, I agree with your point. Um, okay, yeah. So what Manuel is pointing out is that, okay, so in the beginning I said, uh, where is this theorem? Yeah, so like there is a space. You know, there's a unique optohomotopy space with this property. Um, so, you know, if we believe this theorem, uh, then, what, you know, what are we doing? Well, we're checking, we're computing the homotopy groups of this space. And that, you know, that means that this is a KSN1. Um, but, um, and then like, if you believe the uniqueness statement, then that means that this is homotopy equivalent to any other one. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe the way you should interpret this theorem, uh, so like, that like maybe Manuel is saying the theorem would be better if I just wrote this is a KSN1. Is that right. what you're saying? Or you feel free to add, I didn't fully say. Yeah, what. That's, that's, uh, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And then of course you can prove that uh, they're unique, the Eilenberg McLean spaces, right? Yeah. Up to homotopy, yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're gonna be different models. Exactly. This, yeah. So, yeah. So then, but then it's. I mean, of course, it's it's a little bit uh, subtle because you're saying any two models will have a map between them. Yeah. Right. So yeah. 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 The content is like, why should there be a map between any two models? Exactly. It's not obvious. By definition: They need to have the same homotopy groups. Um. But like, why should there be a map that induces that isomorphism? Um, great. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, I agree with Manuel that that might've been a better way to raise the, the theorem at this point. So I guess this is how people often write it, but, and it means the same, you know, thing is just, this is a KSN1, um, and, but you know, okay, thanks. Okay, so the next example, and I guess, you know, saying CP infinity is a KZ2. Uh, so how do you prove that? Do you just look at the, um, um, you know, so C, um, a, you know, um, so, you know, there's like a, a bundle, yeah, or what is CPN? CPN 
is C n plus one minus uh, zero. Cn plus one minus zero mod c star, or if you'd like, it's s two n plus one. Is it two n plus one or two n minus one mod s one? Um, yeah. So it's it's unit length uh, vectors in cn plus one minus one is it n is one uh, i think it's just correct um yeah so cpn we have you know there's a map from uh vectors unit length vectors to uh, lines and the fiber is s1 you send n to, to infinity, so you get a, a fiber bundle with total space S infinity mapping to, you know, in base CP infinity with fiber S1. And then you look at the long exact sequence of homotopy groups using that S infinity is contractible, and you get, you know, that pi i of CP infinity is pi i minus one of S1. And that, that tells you that CP infinity is an eilenberg mclean space uh, for Z in degree two. We know the homotopy groups of S1, and you just shift it up. Um, great. Any questions on this example? Okay. Um, yeah, so you know, the connection to what we we're talking about before is, um, you know, if A is a discrete abelian group, then um, three abelian, or you know, then A of uh, a cube mod A of the boundary is an eilenberg mclean space for A in degree n, and the proof is that you know the homotopy groups of this space are the uh, relative homology groups, you know, which is the same as the reduced homology groups of the quotient, which is just an n sphere. So we get a in degree n and zero otherwise. Um, yeah. So if we go, we go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, you know, the 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 key thing here uh, is just that this is a KZN. So uh, maps from x into a KZN will be um, homology of x. Okay. Where are we? Sorry for jumping so much. Great. Um, so in particular, you know, the existence part, this shows that eilenberg mclean spaces for any abelian group always exist. Right, you know, this is a model. So, uh, the uniqueness we'll talk about tomorrow, but now we have existence for everything other than things that are, um, by tomorrow, I mean two days from now. Um, great. Uh, so we have existence uh, except for non abelian groups where we all, um, will require n to be one. Uh, yeah, so you, you might ask, like, hey, can we construct? A configuration space model for um, AG1 for G not abelian, and your guess would be A, it should just be points in I labeled in G, and they vanish if they enter the boundary. And that, that exactly works. Um, so, but let's try to like figure out what the definition should be. So, uh, here, you know, here's the definition for A of X when X is. Um, is abelian, you know, we just take um, the disjoint union of x to the n cross a to the n, and we mod out by these relations. We mod out by, you know, order doesn't matter. Um, if two points in x are at the same location, you add their labels, and, um, you know, this condition that things vanish if they're labeled by unit, and then if we're talking about the quotient, we would just add this extra relation that 
things vanish if they enter Y. Um, so you could say, okay, like, did we really use that A was uh, abelian here? Can we just try to, you know, maybe any guesses, like what happens if you just, uh, if I just like cross out abelian and just say for A a group and try to perform this construction, like what, what goes wrong? I claim, uh, oh yeah, you don't know the order. Uh, and if I miss someone in chat, feel free to yell or, yeah. So, you know, X1 and X2 aren't ordered because the first step we modded out by the order. Uh, yeah, so now the question is, like, that's fine because um, A1 plus A2 if A is abelian, you know, the order doesn't matter. But if A is not abelian, then it matters what order A1 and A2 are in, but but they're not, you know. You can say, okay, add A1 to A2, like or add A put A1 on the left, but you know, there's no, you know, the order one and two um doesn't exist because of um a relation. Yeah, so that's exactly the problem. Um yeah, so like, you know, in pictures, we have this configuration, like point labeled by A, point labeled by B, point labeled by C. What happens when B and C collide? Like, should this be B uh, times C or C times B? You know, there's no, um, you know, if G is not abelian, there's no continuous way to make that choice. Great. Uh, any questions? Yeah, so the, the idea is this problem goes away for one manifold. Picture is slightly misleading because, you know, or whatever. Well, I'll talk about the picture and then maybe I'll mention why it's a little bit misleading. Um, yeah, so we have a point labeled by A, a point labeled by B, a point labeled by C. When they collide, that, you know, that should be BC. It shouldn't be CB. But the point on the left is multiplied on the left. Because we're in dimension one, it makes sense to say the point on the left. Now you might be like, well, what about a circle? Um, you know, you can still make sense of this in a circle. Um, yeah, so I want X to be a one manifold. If X is like a graph, which is also, you know, one dimensional, I don't know what to do if points collide in the uh, in vertices of a graph. Yeah, so intuitively this is you know this is going to be our model for um for g of x for x of one manifold uh, and this will let us build island berg mclean spaces for non-abelian groups in dimension one um, jeremy um can i say a comment sure um, what if you throw away the first equivalence relation um by the action of the symmetric group I guess you will have you will not have the right um, homotopy type. Yeah, I mean, kind of. But, gonna, like eventually, yeah, I, and it'll kind of be in that spirit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the the nerve <laughs> construction. Yeah. So so yeah, maybe I don't know if the correct thing to do would be to like I'll write down the formula and then we'll come back and see that it's kind of like this. Yeah, you, you know, the comment like why we can't just say, oh, it's A plus, you know, it's A, A1 on the left is because we don't have an order. And then you're like, well, let's not mod out by that. Um, yeah, I mean, so sort of the point is like if you're in an interval, um, when you're in an interval, you, you get an order from the interval, right? Even if your points are unordered, they just inherit an order from the interval. So what you can do, you you want the points to kind of be unordered. What you can do is you can replace condition one with a statement 
that the order from the interval agrees with the order on the points. And then that's basically the, the definition. Um, yeah, okay. So let's like actually write down the definition. And then, you know, if anyone wants me to, you know, or people want me to look at, you know, so we're trying to like, you know, we want this intuition. Let's write down an actual definition. So, um, uh, you know, delta P, the model of the P simplex that I'm going to use is, um, I guess there's two standard models. This is the slightly less standard model. This is, um, you know, subset of I to the N. The standard one is a subset of I to the N plus one, but they're, you know, clearly homeomorphic. Um, so, you know, the simplex is going to, I'm going to think of as tuples of points, uh, where they're all between zero and one and, uh, T1 is smaller than T2 is smaller than T3, et cetera, up to EP. Um, yeah, so when P is zero, this is a point, which you might be like, well, okay, P is zero, it's a point. When P is one, uh, this is an interval. When P is two, this is a solid triangle, et cetera. Okay, so um, this is my model of a simplex. And, uh, you know, I guess the reason why I'm emphasizing that this is a simplex is because we'll um, start talking, you know, talking about simplicial things uh, soon. So, yeah, so what do we, we do? Um, it's configurations of um, points, but now it's th instead of just saying that... Um, um, so I guess I would have been better if I wrote this in the other order. Uh, so, you know, we have points in the interval. These are our Ts. But we require that um, uh, instead of saying they're unordered, we say they're ordered, but their order agrees with the order coming from the interval. So that's this less than or equal to condition. Um, so, yeah, so we have points in the interval, and they're labeled by G. And now, um, when um, when points collide, so when the ith point and the i plus first point collide, you multiply their labels in this order. Uh, and then we have There's a typo, this is a one. So this is saying um, we want configurations in the interval rel boundary. So if the first point hits um, zero, it vanishes, or if the, you know, if the leftmost point goes to zero or the rightmost point goes to one, those points vanish. Uh, oh, this typo is worse. Should be a one, P minus one, one, P minus one. Um, Oh, and then this is saying that you forget a point if it's labeled by one. Um, yeah, so this, um, when G is abelian, this is homeomorphic to the other definition. It's not, um, you know, it's not on the nose the same as the other definition. Um, but, you know, basically what it's saying is they're ordered, but their order agrees with the interval, which is the same thing as saying they're unordered. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry for the, the typo. Um, yeah, so then the theorem is that uh, this, is a, this is an example of a KG1. And what do you do? Well, you can define configurations of points in the interval rel one endpoint in the obvious way. Uh, this is contractible because you can just push all the points into here. Uh, and then you just show that this is a is a vibration with fiber G. Um, and then you you know look at the long exact sequence of homotopy groups. Um, yeah, which will say that um, 
I guess this construction, I guess this theorem should be for G discrete. Uh, I guess because it only makes sense to plug in discrete groups into here. Uh, yeah, so then you, you look at a long exact sequence of homotopy groups and you get that, um, you know, pi one of this space is pi zero of this space and um, the higher homotopy groups vanish. And, you know, there might be some technical difficulties showing that this map is a fiber. Okay. Although, you know, when things were in the interval, we were had more luck in actually rigorously proving things were vibrations. Okay. Uh, any, any questions? Yeah, so um, when G is not abelian uh, and N is one, this, you know, uh, configuration space still makes sense. And uh, it still gives you a model for the island thermal plane spaces. Okay, so um, you know, Jeremy, I have a quick question. So, um, I guess you're assuming G is discrete here, right? Yeah, yeah. I should have written G is discrete. You know, it yeah. makes sense. The thing on the right only makes sense to plug in discrete groups. Exactly, but but the construction. The construction on the left gave, makes sense for topological groups and is important for topological groups. Exactly. But then if you have a topological group and you use a topology, that might not agree with uh, the space you get uh, with the discrete topology. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh. Um, is it, I think... Uh, WebEx told me it's hard for people to hear. I think. I think you're good now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So this construction makes sense if G has topology, um, and the theorem is true when G is discrete. Um, you know, and certainly the topology on you know, if if your group has two different topologies, like for example, the discrete topology or some other top topology, then the topology in this space will depend on which topology you pick on G. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the comment is, you know, is that um, these constructions are really um, constructions involving uh, simplicial sets. So, you know, I'm going to review a little bit about simplicial sets. Um, so we'll, we'll let delta be the category of finite non-empty sets in order of preserving maps. And then a simplicial set or a space is a, is a contravariant functor from delta to um, category of sets or the category of topological spaces. You know, and more generally, a simplicial whatever is a functor, contravariant functor from delta to the category of whatevers. Um, yeah, so you can talk about simplicial groups or sim simplicial, you know, you can talk about the category of simplicial, simplicial, simplicial sets, which are functors, contravariant functors from the category of contravariant functors, the category of contravariant functors to sets, et cetera. Okay. So um, concretely, what do, what do these things are? So if we let P be the set zero through P, then, um, and let's say X bullet is a simplicial space. So, you know, it's a functor. Well, we can evaluate this functor on that set. So we'll let XP be the value of the functor on that set. And this is gonna be a space if X bullet is a simplicial space. So, you know, we have a collection of spaces or, you know, in the set case, just sets. And, um, but then, you know, the functoriality, you know, so that, I guess this is, we're using the functoriality on objects, but we also get functoriality on morphisms. So uh, if you let delta i be the injection that misses i, then functoriality gives you a, a map of spaces. Um, these are, maps are called face maps. And similarly, you can look at the surjections and functoriality gives you map of, of spaces. Um, these maps are called degeneracy maps. Uh, and you should think of, um, you know, face maps as sending a 
simplex to its boundary. So in the in the case where p is a or when x when this thing is a simplicial set, you should think of x p as the the space of or the set of p simplices of x, and this is sending a simplex. Um, these di maps send a simplex to each of their boundaries. Okay, so I guess in the survey, everyone said they knew simplicial sets, but then in person, people said they wanted um, some reminders. Um, is this, should I say more, or is this adequate to remind people what a, is, is, is this, or, you know, and also, like, is this similar language to what, like, Ralph talked about last semester in 572? Or, you know, is, is anyone seeing this for the first time? Also, like, did I confuse I and I plus one anywhere? Like, I minus one and I plus one. Okay, yeah, so I will move on, but... Um, so yeah, so the point is just that our, our constructions, the, the form, the, these configuration space formulas are really simplicial constructions. So um, if you have a simplicial space, there are two different, or a simplicial set, there are two different natural realizations. So you can um, take a set of p-simplices and cross it with an, an honest, you know, geometric p-simplex. So these are called geometric realizations. Um, Oh yeah, so um, the uh, the simplex has maps like include a p simplex into a face of a p plus one simplex, and then there are also collapse maps that collapse the p simplex onto its um, onto its faces, and the geometric realization will be the, this is called the thick geometric realization. It'll be um, um, We'll take you know the set of basically what we're doing is we're taking the set of um, p simplices and identifying the boundary with um, with the faces. Yeah. So if we had if x maybe if x one somehow were. Uh, uh, I'm going to forget degeneracies for a moment. If x1 somehow were a point, maybe I'll call this x, and this were somehow a and b, then, sorry, this is supposed to be zero, then we would get like a point for a, a point for b, and then, um, you know, maybe. Uh, and depending on how the face maps were, either we would have an edge connecting A and B. So, you know, we might have an edge connecting A and B, or, uh, you know, so that would be if uh, one of the face maps mapped X to A and the other face map X, mapped X to B. If both of the face maps mapped X to A, we would get um, just a loop attached A like that, et cetera. You know, if both of the maps mapped X to B, then we'd get a loop at B. Um, yeah, so this is a picture of what the uh, geometric realization looks like. Uh, okay, so thick geometric realization, and then thin one is you also have an equivalence relation where you... Um, um, apply the same relation, but for degeneracies. So, um, you know, at first pass, at least like when I saw things, I'm like, what's the point of degeneracies? And I don't know if Manuel has something non-technical, but my attitude is like, it's somewhat technical why you want degeneracies. Um, and like why, you, um, at all, um, but um, 
yeah, I don't know. Manuel, do you have any like nice statement about why we should want degeneracies? I mean, like I know that you want degeneracies so that you have good product formulas and things like that, but I don't know what the intuition is. Like, why don't we always just work, you know, with sem? How do you convince someone that we shouldn't be working with semi-simplicial sets instead? I don't know. Okay. Um, so, and then these two realizations. So there's a natural map. You know, this one's the quotient of that one. The Would you mind going back and um, and explaining a little bit of the the the, the equivalence relation? Oh yeah. Uh, so like, I don't I don't really like I understand your picture, the one you drew before. Yeah. But, but how is it related to this? Oh yeah. So what I'm saying is, so without the relation, we would have like one line and two points. And so what it's you know this line. These are terrible colors. Whatever. Okay, I can't erase them. Um, you know, and so this is. Um, so. Like so, this is like delta one cross set x. And this is delta zero cross the set AB. Are you happy that this is a picture before we've imposed the equivalent? Yes. Yep. Okay. And so then the um um uh, there's you know a map from like this map, this is like the map D0, point goes to interval, and then D1 is that map, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say, you know, D lower zero of X is A. So what this equivalence relation is saying is that we're identifying so th um, this point right here is um, is this point right here is like x. This point right here is like that point. And this point down here is that point. And where did the D lower zero come from? D low, oh yeah, so I sort of, D lower zero, so we have these maps from a P simplex to a P plus one simplex where you include it in as a face. Oh, sorry, the, the lower zero is your question? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, like Anderson. Part, part of being a simplicial uh, set is we have these two maps, x1, x0. Yeah, so we have like a set of zero simplices, a set of one simplices, and we have two maps here, which are like, remember the left endpoint and remember the right endpoint maps. Okay. And then you have three maps here, which are like, you know, we have the set of, X3 is the set of two simplices, and it's, you know, remember all three of the kinds of faces. You know, a triangle has three sides. So you get three maps like this. Um, yeah, so what we're, um, doing yeah so the red point is that point and then 
that blue corresponds to that. And so then this is saying we're gluing these two points. We're gluing the red and the blue together. Yeah, I see it now. You know, yeah, assuming D lower zero of X is A. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then similarly, you know, if D1 of X is B, we'd glue this to there. Um, but, you know, right. it could also be A, and then we would, we would just glue on a loop to A. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then... Um, yeah, and uh, I guess, like... Running out of time. Uh, oh, it's good. I get to make less slides. Running out of time. Um, and then you know, there's a similar so you know store. So there, there is something called a semi-simplicial set, which is more intuitive and is like a simplicial set, but you don't have degeneracies. Um. So you know, a simplicial set. We have these you know degenerate simplices and non-degenerate simplices. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, maybe here's a, if people are confused by this, I, I somehow was like going up on the survey, assuming that like people knew this somewhat well. Um, but like, if people don't know it somewhat well, I like to start out with telling people what a semi-simplicial set is, uh, and then you get sort of a more intuitive description. Um, w w would anyone like me to start next class with like a 20-minute review of simplicial sets and defining semi-simplicial sets and trying to give more intuition? Um, yeah, or may maybe... I, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know, is, 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 is there, I, mean, I, I like that, but I, I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but uh, I think that would be helpful, at least for me. Okay, um, is it, um, 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 did cover uh, semi-simplicial sets and simplicial, simplicial sets in this way, but he did it like on one lecture and then he moved totally to thinking of this of like a more geometric way of uh of okay. just like maps from actual simplices um into whatever we were in, like into any space we were trying to deal with so we kind of forgot about this yeah uh, so m maybe i'll um um yeah I'll, I'll yeah so maybe i'll give like a 15 minute review um next time uh, and then you know so sort of i guess i'm basically out of time but the the point the point is going to be that you know whatever the point is going to be that there's a model you know that this this construction involves simplices and modding out by stuff and the point is going to be that this is really just a geometric realization of a simplicial space um but yeah i'll say that slower um next time um yeah any questions oh is there something in chat uh, oh yeah, so I guess Manuel put a a, a link um, for simplicial sets into um, into chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, sounds uh, sounds good. I'll wait. I'll wait a minute before I turn off. Um, before I end the meeting, but. Great. Yeah. Talk to you guys on, on Tuesday, on Thursday.